Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Tracy, recently the American College of Physicians, the ACP as it's known, reviewed the guidelines for treating patients with type 2 diabetes and provided its own recommendations. Then they were published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. The ACP is now recommending that patients should aim to have A1C levels between 7 and 8%. Now, A1C is a measure of your average blood sugar levels over the past two to three months. But medical groups that specialize in diabetes treatment, including the American Diabetes Association, strongly disagree with the ACP's less stringent blood sugar goals and stand by their current guidelines, recommending an A1C level below 7%. This all adds up to a lot of confusion for diabetes patients. Here to discuss those recommendations and comment on the controversy is Mayo Clinic endocrinologist Dr. Adrian Vela. Welcome to the program, Dr. Vela. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Dr. Vela, great to see you. Great to have you on the program, especially to discuss this subject. You know, uh, we've had some controversy about blood pressure guidelines, and they've been changing. We've had some controversy about when women ought to start giving, getting their mammograms, at what age. And now we've got some controversy over uh, what the ideal blood sugar level is, and diabetics ought to keep their blood sugar at what level. Can, doctors can't agree on anything? <laughs> well, I always say that guidelines serve mainly the purpose of the people who write them, so you have to keep that in mind sometimes. But joking aside, I think guidelines apply, should be applied to perhaps 90% of our our practice, but we always have to recognize that there are individual patients for whom exceptions should be made. As you mentioned, the A1C is a running average of your blood sugars over the previous three months. And uh, um, it's a measure which correlates best with outcomes. So um, with diabetes, we we are worried about complications affecting the vascular system. So there are macrovascular complications which affect large vessels and um, which are associated with heart attacks, for example, or stroke. The A1C correlates best with microvascular complications of diabetes, which is um, neuropathy. Small blood vessels. Yes, small blood vessels, I'm sorry. Neuropathy, so the tingling and loss of sensation in the feet, which sometimes causes you to shorten people's legs (laughs) uh, because of (laughs) ulcers that don't heal. Kidney disease and kidney failure, and diabetes is certainly the leading cause of hemodialysis in the United States. And blindness, retinal complications. Now, we know that there is strong scientific basis for suggesting an A1C below 7%, because in a population, those complications rise dramatically once your A1C is consistently above 7%. That's where the 7% recommendation came from. I just want to point out one thing, uh, or ask you one thing, and that is the A1C is also important in knowing how well the patient has controlled their diabetes despite what they say. I mean, they might come of in course. and, and, and the, you say, they say, well, you know, I've got my diabetes under control, and today it was uh, 120 and, or, or 90 or 100, and that's pretty good. But if you do that A1C test, you find out if, in fact, what they're telling you is true and if they, in fact, have been controlling their blood sugar, right? That, that, is, that is correct. Yeah, okay. um, it is not the be-all and end-all um, because, in a sense, it's like the altimeter on a plane, okay? It might tell you that you're flying at 30,000 feet, but it's not going to tell you that there's a mountain which is 35,000 feet high a mile away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have to interpret things in the right context. But certainly, um, aiming below seven is a good target for most people. Balanced against that is that as you aim lower, you might increase the risk for hypoglycemia. Not enough blood sugar. Correct, low blood sugar. Low blood glucose. Which which might cause people to have altered mentation, they can get confused, they can pass out, they can have a seizure. So it's not always, it's not a good thing. And you certainly don't want patients to have hypoglycemia frequently. So it, it is reasonable to balance the risk of hypoglycemia in an individual patient versus the risk of complications when you're setting a target. 
an 80-year-old who doesn't have complications, you may be less worried about their 10-year risk of developing small blood vessel complications from the diabetes, but you're certainly going to be more worried if they have a low blood sugar. So in those situations, you might justify a slightly higher A1C target if the goal is to prevent hypoglycemia. But overall, as a blanket recommendation, I would still advocate that seven or below is a reasonable target. So you're on the side of the American Diabetes Association. I most certainly am. And what is Mayo Clinic's position on A1C guidelines? I I think most of my colleagues would agree with that statement. I think that over the years it's become easier to achieve an A1C of seven or below while avoiding hypoglycemia. Um, There are multiple medications which make it less likely to cause hypoglycemia. And also, there are easier modalities to check your blood sugar so that you know if you're going low or not. So you're saying that the importance of keeping the blood sugar low or within range outweighs the risk of having an occasional episode of the blood sugar too low or hypoglycemia? Um, Not quite. (laughs) What I am saying is is that... um, In an ideal world, we should always avoid a low blood sugar because a low blood sugar might have immediate consequences um, that, you know, are of relevance to the patient just as much as the 10-year consequences of complications. But I think balancing that risk is a lot easier today. Well, there are lots of ways for patients to measure their blood sugar, and can't they sort of tell when their blood sugar is getting low and have a candy bar or some orange juice? They can. They can. Um... And as I said, today, a lot of medication makes it possible to keep your blood sugars in a range which is acceptable for glycemic control without putting you at increased risk for complications. Um, And then there is this question of awareness of low blood sugars and their ability to handle a low blood sugar, um, which might change the equation slightly. Certainly an airline pilot, you know, the risk of hypoglycemia is paramount. So nobody can get a commercial flying license if they're on insulin to date. There Uh, is, in fact, an epidemic of diabetes in this this country, right? There is an epidemic of diabetes in this country. All related to obesity, pretty much? Uh, No. I think that would be a bit unfair. Okay. Um, So diabetes is a disease which, unfortunately, uh, the patient is the person who gets blamed most of the time for having diabetes. But the fact of the matter is that um, there is some heterogeneity in um, the uh, person's resistance and ability to make insulin uh, in the face of dietary indiscretion. So if you look at people who need bariatric surgery, okay, who are extremely overweight, only one third of those people actually have diabetes. So even at that extreme of weight, you still have people who do not have diabetes Um, And there are people who are lean um, and yet develop diabetes in their 50s, um, despite having done all the right things. All right, so you're on the side of the American Diabetes Association. People with type 2 diabetes ought to keep their A1C at 7% or lower. If at all possible, yes. I think it would be wise to discuss targets with with your primary caregiver. Always wise to do that. Always wise to do that. Endocrinologist. Dr. Adrian Vella from the Mayo Clinic talking about the new diabetes guidelines, the Mayo Clinic opinion on the same. Thanks, Dr. Vella. My pleasure. Thank you.